if you don't believe in Bitcoin, maybe you shouldn't be in the business. Like if you're going to look me in the face and if you don't think Bitcoin's going to a million dollars a coin and then $10 million a coin, I don't think you should be a Bitcoin miner. I don't think you should be a Bitcoin exchange. I don't think you should be a Bitcoin wallet. I don't think you should, I, I just don't think you should be, uh, you shouldn't be a pure play focused in the business at all because you're already, you're already a loser. You've already decided you're going to lose. If you think your assets going to zero, it's hopeless, all these other things. Michael Saylor's recent interview resonates with a resounding message. If you doubt Bitcoin's potential to hit $10 million per coin, you're already behind. Saylor's unwavering conviction in Bitcoin's future underscores the necessity for believers in the cryptocurrency space. He argues that without this fundamental belief, Participation in Bitcoin's ecosystem lacks purpose, equating skepticism with setting oneself up for failure. Throughout the interview, Saylor emphasizes the importance of faith in Bitcoin's value and its ability to achieve remarkable price points. For him, doubting Bitcoin's trajectory is akin to conceding defeat prematurely. His strong stance encourages industry participants to align their perspectives with his, highlighting the critical role of optimism and confidence in driving Bitcoin's success. Saylor concludes with a comprehensive view on Bitcoin's transformative potential in the economic landscape. He paints a picture of Bitcoin as a catalyst for profound change, urging viewers to stay tuned for his insights on how Bitcoin is poised to reshape the financial world as we know it. Ever feel like you're wasting your money on things that don't really matter? Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out on this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself now. Don't spend $12.50 on junk. Educate yourself on how to be successful in crypto using our Crypto Cheat Guide. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Visit the website now on the link in the description for your exclusive copy. Start your journey to crypto success today. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. Out of 100 possibilities, there's 99 paths where you fail and Bitcoin succeeds. And there's one path where you fail, where you succeed and Bitcoin succeeds. And, you know, some people don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, but they're not, they're not with us, right? You don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed. Go do something else, you know, whatever with your life, but don't, don't try to create a Bitcoin business. It becomes clearer and clearer that this is the future of digital property. This is digital energy. This is the future of digital money. This is the solution to the, the problems of the world. This is a macroeconomic imperative for $500 trillion worth of capital. This is a technical imperative for everybody in the technology industry and the energy industry. And this is a moral imperative for everybody on earth, right? So I've just become more convicted every single week, every single month that's gone by. It's like, you know, you're just, you're watching every shoe drop Companies adopting, banks adopting, politicians supporting, right? The, the negative FUD in the media is, is just people noticing that Bitcoin is the most disruptive technology of the decade. And, and even the negative publicity is positive publicity. It's all just marketing Bitcoin. It's like if these people hate on it so much, why? It must be really good that they're so afraid of it. And, and we're... You know how you have a shock wave? Um, a shock wave forms when you move faster than the, uh, than the air. If I move through the air faster than, than uh, the air can, um, can flow around me, then I create a shock wave. Uh, I'm disrupting laminar flow and I'm getting turbulence because I'm going too fast, okay? Bitcoin is creating turbulence because it's going too fast. Right? When you see some uninformed politician that critiques it, it's because they were asked to have an opinion and they had 10 minutes to study it. And so they give an uninformed opinion. When some billionaire investor says they like gold better, it's because they're asked to have an opinion and they spent 30 years studying gold and they haven't spent 30 hours or 300 hours or a thousand hours studying Bitcoin. They had 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 15 minutes. A lot of people, you know, when these editorials are written in the journal and the New York Times, it's I never seen anybody ever say, oh, I spent a thousand hours studying Bitcoin. Let me break down my problems with it. I never seen anybody say I spent a hundred hours studying it. Let me tell you the 13 problems I have, you know, 
There are no informed critiques. I have yet to see them. There are uninformed critiques. And what is that? That's the same as your fighter jet slamming into a wall of air faster than the speed of sound and you get a shock wave and you get turbulence and you get heat and you get sound and fury. And is that a bad thing? It just means we're moving fast, right? We're moving very fast and we're getting noticed and everyone has to notice it, right? And when you're asking the spokesperson for the Kremlin, you know, for, for, for Putin, whether or not Russia is going to adopt Bitcoin as the national currency, that's not, when they say not yet or no, that's not, that's not a negative signal. That's a positive signal. Nobody asked Putin whether they're going to adopt Apple stock or gold or silver or the giant stone coin of the Yap people as currency in Russia, right? There's only one question they're asking them. And they're asking them the question because it's on the table and that's indicative of the success of Bitcoin. So to summarize, I am more bullish than ever. I think Bitcoin as a network is going to continue to grow and it's going to demonetize other assets. And that the assets it's going to demonetize will be a function of the cultures that it's within. So for example, in a culture uh, where you have hyperinflation and the government collapses, it's going to demonetize the currency because everybody desperately needs a currency and there isn't an alternative. Um, in a culture where people, uh, people feel it's unsafe to own property, like for example, if you had weak property rights, and you felt like the government was going to seize your house or seize your land, or you couldn't own land, maybe it's illegal to own land, then Bitcoin's going to demonetize the property. Like if you have a million dollars, you're not going to invest it in land if you don't trust the, your property rights. Like, for example, like I wouldn't be comfortable making an investment in an apartment building in a city that has shown itself willing to strip landlords of their rights, right? Right. So you're holding an apartment building. You can't you can't charge your your uh, tenants to live in the apartment building, nor can you evict them. Okay, what's the what's the logical value of the building? Does it go up or does it go down in that circumstance? And if I have if I have discretionary cash, am I going to reinvest it in more apartment buildings or not? And I think the answer is wherever we see property impaired, the monetary energy in the property is going to flow to an alternative which is better. So in the US I think that, the, that in the US people are comfortable with the US dollar and what they're not comfortable with or less comfortable with is maybe uh, risky stocks or, or risky property investments or say gold, things like that. And so it's logical that Bitcoin strips the monetary premium from commodities, securities, indexes, credit, like. Like for example, I got a million dollars and I could invest it in 30 year T-bills yielding 1.6% or I could buy Bitcoin. Oh. You know, what's gonna happen there is, I, my company had a lot of that, right? We, we, had, uh, we would normally put 90% of our treasury into sovereign debt and only 50 million of it or 10% of it was sitting in cash. So, what we did is we demonetized the sovereign debt for the most part and we rolled into Bitcoin. So I think in the, in the developed world, in Europe and the US, I think that, that Bitcoin is going to demonetize uh, debt, low grade debt or, or low yielding debt and credit. It's going to demonetize savings accounts. But I mean, it's uh, most people had already given up on savings accounts by the time we got the last year what they go to ETFs. And so I think Bitcoin actually grabs uh, monetary energy or capital from ETFs, from commercial real estate and from debt in the developed world.
I think in the uh, in the developing world, and you know, in places like Iran, even in China, in North Korea, in in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iran, in Iraq, and Afghanistan, <laughs> lots of places like that. Well, you don't have a stable banking system. You're not even dollarized. Your currency is much worse than that, right? So I think that. I think that、uh, what you're going to see is that if there's 180 countries or something out there, I think that 15 or 20 of them keep their currency privileges. I think the bottom 100 are going to lose their currencies. I think they're going to dollarize first. Everybody wants to, but how do I dollarize? The best way to dollarize is the El Salvador strategy, which is I have a mobile application which has got dollars and it's got Bitcoin. On the Lightning Network,、uh, what you want is you want a currency as a medium of exchange. It's like a stable value coin, stable versus all of the pricing of the retailers, and that's like a dollar. It's probably the most stable thing in the universe. And then you want an asset which is an appreciating,、uh, appreciating、uh, token that will will hold its value over time, and that's Bitcoin. And if you wanted to maximize your utility, you would, you kind of put ninety percent of your balance sheet into the asset, into Bitcoin, and then you put the last piece, the working capital or the checking account, into whatever is the currency、uh, that most of the retailers that you're surrounded with take. So if I was in Japan, I'd be holding one month worth of yen. And if I was in Italy, I'd be holding one month worth of euro. And if I'm in the U.S. or a dollar economy, I'm holding one month worth of dollars. And then the rest, I'm sweeping into into my long-term asset portfolio or property portfolio. And my stack of property is, you know, I maybe I buy a property to live in because it's a nice house and I want to live in it for the rest of my life, and I can't rent it. Maybe. Then maybe I buy my trophy art, or you know, maybe I buy the picture because I love the picture, or maybe I buy the car, or maybe I buy the boat, or maybe I buy the plane, or something because I want to fly in it, float in it, live in it, whatever I want to do. But all my discretionary asset I would put into the highest quality property, which is of course Bitcoin. In his discussion, Michael Saylor delves into the necessity of believing in Bitcoin and its profound capacity to reshape various aspects of our lives. Spanning from businesses and financial systems to everyday routines, Saylor addresses the prevailing perceptions and criticisms surrounding Bitcoin, suggesting that even negative attention highlights its disruptive potential. Despite these challenges, Saylor reiterates his optimistic outlook on Bitcoin, expressing a heightened conviction in its success and indispensable role in the future. He urges others to adopt a similar mindset, emphasizing the importance of shared belief in Bitcoin's transformative power. For more daily dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now, and we will see you on the next video.